name's Anna Cooper. Um, I'm a, a candidate in the Department of French and Italian. Um, and I'm here today to interview Professor McCarran about her new book, which has just been published this year uh, by Oxford University Press. Could you describe the genesis of this project and provide a brief overview of what it's about? This project came out of work that I'm doing with the Cultural History for Dance seminar in Paris at the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales with a group of young scholars who are working on uh, the history of dance and the history of science. They're working on the dance archive and history of body. And I wanted to, I was thinking about the ways in which the ballet stages the green world, flora and fauna in nonverbal dance roles. And these roles are ways to think about also historic conceptions of sex and race. So we might think of them today as colonial, but we can take a sort of post-colonial approach to the way that gender and race were being thought about, were being made, and were being nuanced in these dance roles on stage. That's why I wrote the book. So La Chance is a ballet about, it's an Orientalist ballet. There were many of them uh, performed in the 19th century. But this one also has uh, a sort of environmental narrative, a green story um, connected to it. And in this uh, caricature, it's a cartoon really from 1866, making fun of the ballet. You see that they were taking the the environmental narrative, and they were really running with it. They were making fun of different classes of plants um, that were being mobilized in the ballet, not just flowers, but you know, kitchen garden, right, and mushrooms, um, um, plants that were being used as, as essentially as drugs, right, pharmacopoeia. And they, they're clearly, they get the botany that the ballet is encoding um, but they're also able to gently mock it, right, to make fun of it. And this shows that the audience was really thinking about plants and all of the kinds of knowledges that botany would encode. So the archive is a very fragile thing, especially for dance. Um, but the archive in general, as you know, um, can disappear, it can move. Um, it's not very stable. There's a very beautiful book by Arlette Favre about working on the police archive in Paris, in which she talks about the historical agents that she's looking at as more real or more true than, um, you know, characters from literature, for example. But having been trained in literature, I would say that um, those characters are also very real or very true, often for us. So when I'm working in the ballet archive, I'm thinking all the time about other closely related archives. Literature is, of course, one of them, but um, the police archive, um, the newspapers, there are many kinds of archives to look at. But for dance history, we also have to look at the repertory, and it's that living, um, continuing um, presence of dancers on the stage that make us understand something about what happened in the history. So I had to look broadly across a range of archives, but I had to also think about the living, breathing archive of dancers and of the repertory that continues today. So flowers and uh, flora and fauna in general, the green world, are very important in this ballet, um, and as they were in many ballets from the mid 19th century, from the, the repertory. Um, but this particular flower, um, I argue, isn't just ornamental or isn't just decorative, but really encodes a kind of current scientific knowledge. Um, first of all, historical knowledge from botany, 
but also current thinking about um, the, the whole ecology, right, which was a new term in 1866. The, what links, what connects um, people to plants and animals. So I argue that in this ballet, actually, people are thinking about um, the plants in the same way that they're thinking about humans, right? Who belongs with whom? Uh, what does it take to survive? Um, things that we think of now as a Darwinian narrative. But these were playing out in botany um, throughout the 19th century, and, and they were featured, I think, in this ballet and on this stage. I would also like to say that the flower um, obviously encodes something about, um, about love, it encodes something about sex, um, certainly um, plant sexuality was a really important site of study. So it isn't just um, secrets and, and euphemisms that are circulating, but it's really also thinking about um, the way that the plant life can reflect on human life and the way that human life can project itself onto plant life. So in uh, the chapter of my book, um, it's, it's a bit of a detective story, right? Like a puzzle that I'm piecing together. And I'm taking the reader to four historic performances. And I'm arguing that the ballet might not have played exactly the same way in these four historic moments. So in 1866, I focus on the plants and the, the real interest in, in biology um, and life science. And, and the way the ballet stages this knowledge. But in 1875, the ballet is programmed by a, a very new Third Republic, um, and it's the gala opening soiree where it's performed at the Palais Garnier, is led by the head of the, the new head of the Third Republic, the General Mike Mahon, with the military history, etc. So it's gonna play a little bit differently, and it's going to have uh, a different commentary for this audience. And the, what I argue is that in this context, it really reflects something that happened um, in 1869, which was the opening of the Suez Canal. So if you look at the iconography around the Suez, you'll see that the Empress Eugenie appeared in a white dress, and she was kind of presenting this French genius of water um, engineering, right? And the iconography actually looks like the 1866 ballet that preceded it, that's called La Suisse, which is the subject of my book. And by 1875, I think everyone was familiar with this iconography, and there had been other water engineering marvels accomplished by this French uh, genius, you know, around the world. So um, I'm arguing that people watching the ballet in 1875 couldn't help but think about that cultural precursor, but they were also seeing the ballet for the first time in this new theater, the Golden Opera House that we know today as the Palais Garnier, which everyone knows, um, but had to pump water out of the foundation for more than a year and which still holds underneath it a kind of mysterious lake, right? Um, if you've seen the Phantom of the Opera, you know about this lake under the Opera House. Well, it's, it's a reality, right? So um, they were gonna be thinking about the ballet in these technological terms, reflecting the recent history of science and not just the botanical history that I argue was so important for the first audience. So when the opera takes up this ballet from the archive and redoes it in 2011, um, there's a lot at stake, right? It wants to show that there's been an important French history of ballet, that French ballet has been superior, it's had its own style, and they really focus on this idea of dream and re-enchantment in order to sell it, right? 
And I do think this kind of hollows out, as you say, the, the core, the really important historical core of the ballet, which was that it was about knowledge and it was also constituting a form of knowledge about bodies, about ecologies, um, about hybridity and acclimatization, as I try to show in the book. So um, what, is, what is it then about? What does it become about? Well, it is commenting on its own time, but maybe not in the way that the original ballet did. Because if you think of ballet only as entertainment or as enchantment, you're going to miss the fact that the ballet can critique the state of things, it can critique its own time, the way that people think about bodies, or the way they think about the green world as being represented on stage. So it kind of takes away from ballet the very power um, that, that I'm trying to show it really has had historically. So in 2011, one of the things that the ballet didn't comment on was the Arab Spring, which was very much um, drawing everyone's attention, right? There's a scene in the ballet where a young woman is unveiled precipitously by a suitor. And um, in 1866, this uh, had a bit of a shock, but it was really part of a colonial see it as a colonial gesture now, right? Uh, in sync with French um, activity, French policy, French aggression, even in North Africa. Well, in 2010, the law that was passed was uh, based on really concern about, um, uh, you know, terrorism and jihad related to things that were going on in the Middle East. And there was concern about um, people forcing women to wear the veil. Um, the fine for forcing someone to wear a veil was much deeper than the fine for wearing a, a veil, like a burqa, a total veil in public space in France. The whole thing is, is um, a, a long-standing story in France and, and a real problem. Um, what the Arab Spring showed in 2011 was that women could be veiled and very much part of pro-democracy movements. Um, the veil doesn't have to be considered to be at odds with the notion of French republicanism. Um, France has, has not been able to understand that, it seems. And this is quite different from Britain, for example, or, or other places. Um, in my own experience living in the Muslim world, um, I've seen many women, members of my own family, my husband's family, choosing to wear the veil, and, and it isn't about oppression uh, or submission in any way. So um, when this scene plays out in 2011, it's described uh, in the libretto as an unthought, um, thoughtless, you know, quick gesture. The suitor wants to see the face of his beloved. But of course, it's much more than that. It really becomes a symbol for the Republic determined to unveil um, women in a, in a way that's really out of sync with what was going on in the Arab world um, that, that very year. It's a great question, thank you. So the opera is trying to change. It is trying to bring more minority dancers uh, into its company, from its school. And it is trying to think about sustainable productions and sustainable work um, you know, by its dancers. So um, I, I hope that the general force of things is going to change. Um, you know, this institution which has been very hierarchical and um, in many ways old-fashioned, right? Um, I, I think what we saw in 2014 in La Source was just a hint of what it might have been or what it might be to um, take a ballet, a historic ballet, 
that is thinking about both the environment and political questions that Isabel Spengers has called cosmopolitical, right? So thinking about this broader ecology of practices and really allow dance performers and dance choreography to, to say something important about, about the way that they're connected, right? Now, the, this last production of La Source closed on December 31st, uh, 2014, and just a, less than a week later, we had the attacks at Charlie Hebdo. Later in 2015, we had um, other attacks, and we also had the COP21, right, the climate conference in uh, Paris, where the Paris Accords were signed at the end of 2015. So this ballet was actually incredibly timely, a, historic, a historical text that is really talking about things that are still very, very um, powerful in, in the world uh, today. And um, I think the opera missed a chance to, to show the relevance of this historic piece. Um, but I think it, it knows that it, it can do better and, and it will do better. Um, the really important detail for me here is that when um, François Hollande, the president of the French Republic, um, called for the state of emergency to be put in place following the November attacks, he did um, later acknowledge that the reason for this was to secure the um, Planet Climate Conference. It wasn't so much about um, the violence, right? Um, and this has been a narrative that we've been seeing um, over centuries, right? That we're going to always be focusing on political violence and on contemporary threat, you know, the way we perceive it, rather than the long-term um, concerns about all humanity and about uh, climate, for example, about the health of the planet, right? Well, it's very hard to summarize um, into one thought or one sentence. But I think if, if readers could catch something of the excitement of the performance, right, that that's what's really important. We pull something from the archive or we look at something that's in the repertory today, but we also want to think about the spectators, right, and the context of the production of these performances. Now, right now in, in, in this moment of pandemic, this is the thing that we've lost, that we're very aware of having lost, the coming together of people in public spaces, the sharing of um, cultural production, the incredible thought-provoking, um, powerful um, ways that performance can move us, make us think, connect us to the past, um, promise something for the future. That's what I hope readers would take from this book.